Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, we're getting some more ballistic tips and proving that even a cameraman can hit a 300-yard row while filming it. We're out with top stalker Paul Taylor looking for seeker. But first, forget this wet, cold mork. Let's have some warm summer sunshine and go fishing. Oliver Edwards is one of the gods of fly fishing and he's brought out a series of eight DVDs to prove it. We talked to his film producer, Mark Gardner, about how they made the films. He's been fishing since he was a, a young boy. He's fished for England. He's captained the England team on one occasion. Um, in terms of fly tying, I would rate him up in certainly the top few in the world. I mean, even he's well known here and in America. He's, both has a fly fisherman and a fly tire. Where does he where does he rate? I mean, do, do fly fishermen have is is there a great god of fly fishing? There's one sort of benchmark person. No, no fly fishing is such a broad sport well, that there isn't one person. I don't think you can turn around and say dominates. Uh, but in terms of where what Oliver's good at, which is imitative flies, so his flies look like the real thing. Um, I would have said that a lot of people look up to him as the master in that area. This fly fools them. I'm sure they see the little footprints in the film as the initial trigger. Then when the single loop wing comes over the window, they're totally fooled and just eat it. You should tie up a few of these in one or two sizes and colourways to match the hatch on your stream. We made one film to start off with, uh, which was up, shot up on the year at Massam about Chet Nymphing, and it worked, it worked an absolute dream. The guy was fantastic in front of the camera. And a lot of people you get, you put a camera up and immediately they clamp up and just can't perform, whereas Oliver just, you know, has this ability just to talk and talk and talk, and communicate, and makes it from a point of view of producing the director an absolute dream to work with. And the only thing I can't direct are the fish. Approximately 80% of what trout and grayling eat is take off or very near the stream bed. And a great proportion of that food is caddis larva. This is what makes Czech nymphing one of the most effective methods of fly fishing. It's quite simply an essential skill for any fly fisherman. However, before we go off and fish, let's have a dig around on the stream bed and find out what's down there for the fish to eat. fishing film, which was one we one of our most recent films, some of the techniques that we talk about in there go back 250 years. And in some ways they have been superseded and forgotten and actually are, are far superior techniques to the traditional wet tuck fly technique that's used today. So in some senses we've gone back to books 250 years old, some angling classics, um, techniques that Oliver uses anyway, and said no, this is time we brought this out into the open, aired it, and I'll show you the, the three main techniques for wet fly fishing and their advantages and their disadvantages. There's times when they're good and there are times when they're bad. So it's that we discussed, and in particular what's known as upstream wet fly fishing, which has virtually disappeared these days. I mean, I think purely and simply for the reason it is, compared to traditional downstream techniques, it's hard work. You're constantly casting with the flies moving against you. You catch a lot more fish. So, say the choice is yours. Practiced centuries ago, well, at least one and a half centuries ago, um, the short line upstream, the pocket picking, the close control, and it's skillful and it works, but it's a lot of hard work. You're working all the time. We catch the bugs on the bottom of the river, either with nets or by lifting over rocks, so he can show you the the insects the trout are eating, when they're eating them, why they're eating them, what period of their life cycles they're in. He then goes and ties those and makes good matches of them. And finally, you know, if you like drawing the full circle together, shows you the, the appropriate technique to fish those, those, those flies once you, you know what the insect is, how to choose your fly. So in some senses, this is not a sort of a watch a DVD and then you can fish this sort of river. It's trying to teach you how you should approach your fly fishing in general. It doesn't matter that if there's the, the river that you're fishing is not the same, exactly the same as the rivers that we show in these DVDs. The knowledge you'll get from this and the techniques and the approach you should take are all in here 
you'll be able to go to your river, turn over a few stones, and you will find those insects in your river. They may be slightly darker, they may be slightly lighter, they may be a bit bigger, a bit smaller, but you go, well, I recognise that. And I've got one of those in my fly box here, because if they're on the riverbed, the trout are going to be eating them. I remember one day, I mean, we were breaking for lunch. It had been a, a long morning. We got up very, very early. And I had the crew down, and it, there was no track to the river. There were nowhere getting vehicles down. So everyone had to carry all the equipment down these steep banks to the river bank. And I think it, it got to about 1.32, and everyone was hungry because I had enough. So I said, come on, guys, it's, it's lunch. Let's break. But I just couldn't get Oliver out of the river. He just said, I can have one more cast, lad, and I'll come and join you. So the camera crew were carrying all the gear. We'd done about 400 yards from him. And there's this shout, I've got one. And he was fishing with the, one of the streamer patterns and he'd caught the most enormous trout. And it wasn't like, we'll get one after lunch, Oliver. It's too late now. It was, he was screaming, get back. So we all ran back with the camera gear, got ourselves set up and we managed to cover it off. And say, the fish was so big, it took him 10 or 15 minutes to put it in. So, um, it was one of those days when we were sitting there out of breath trying to control ourselves and film this at the same time. That was a, that was one of those sort of days that you don't forget. But actually, honestly, with the, with the filming, and the, you look at the locations in it, there's just, it's just to be at those sort of places is a, a real pleasure and a real joy. So there are just too many highlights for me to mention in one in particular. <laughs> Now let's put those rods away and reach for the rifle with Keith Poyser and his ballistic tips. Here we're showing again sitting position which is as I said a decent mid-range and so forth position. Uh, very usable in the field. Sitting against a tree, breaking up my outline waiting for some deer to cross or knowing there's a deer run or a fox run or whatever here. Um, for these purposes, we're just showing it's accurate at 300 yards. And um, I've got a supported position here. I've got the stick set up. I can sit here for hours and hours very comfortably indeed against this oak. Um, and as you can see, what I'm doing is I've got as many points of support as possible. As I've said, I've got a wide base and I'm naturally aligned with the target without muscling onto the target. So I don't have muscle tension in my shot and lined up. I've got elbows supported on my knees. I'm naturally comfortable. I've spotted the target and the foundations of breathing and trigger apply. And as you can hear with the ding, heart and lung shot raised down. Quite comfortable and no muscle tension whatsoever. You can stay in that position for, for hours. I want to show you as well, slightly harder, taking a slight risk on camera, but um, slightly harder, but sitting without sticks is actually perfectly reasonable in this position too. So I don't have sticks, but I'm sitting against the tree, nicely supported, and I've got naturally a line position, but I'm going to take the weight a little bit on my arms, elbows on my arms, very comfortable, trying to get bone support with a straight line. And there's the row. Plenty of time. And that's Ray down. As you can see, just stayed in the shot, no rush. Perfectly stable, 300 yard position. Now, what we're going to do, just to prove that these principles can apply to everyone, is we're going to get David, the cameraman, to take a shot on camera now. David hasn't done a lot of rifle shooting, but we've had a bit of a chat. We've pointed out the fundamentals. We've pointed out the breathing, the trigger control, the stop weld and the follow through, all of which David is going to remember, as well as his positional stability. We're going to let him use sticks because we're nice like that, but he's going to have a go at a 300 yard row for the first time in his life using those principles. Aren't you, David? Yeah. Okay, so here we go. You uh, sit on there and get nice and comfy. And you're roughly the same size and height as me anyway. So probably a little bit more side on, a little tiny bit more. That's it, have that leg slightly forward. Awesome. Now, put your elbows on your knees and see if you're naturally aligned. So you probably want to turn sideways more. Naturally aligned to that deer. See that deer down there? Yeah. Naturally aligned, feels yep. quite comfy. Yep. Brilliant, there's the rifle, remember it's quite heavy. Yep. There's nothing in the rifle and the bolt's open, so I'm gonna walk in front of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see with the sticks, don't change anything except 
that the sticks take the weight, and you may find it easier to hold hold the sticks steady. Okay. Yes. Yep. I can turn that down for you if you're more comfortable. You don't want to see the oh, wobble. Yeah, 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 it's much better. I can't see the burn thing. Okay, now I can see it. Now you can see it. I can turn it up for you if you like. Yep. Is that good? Yep. Excellent. I'm going to load for you. So what you want to do is a very light trigger. Is you're going to dry fire one. Yep. You're going to dry fire that, nice and steady, remember you're breathing, everything relaxed, and in your natural pause, don't even think about the rifle going off, just squeeze through the trigger, okay, don't flinch, right. okay? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, this time, do it again, and make sure you don't flinch, mm -hmm. again. And I'm not going to tell you when I'm going to load the rifle, because I don't want you to flinch. Okay. Yeah. How's that, nice and steady? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, David. So no pressure's not on or anything, but if you miss, you buy the pint. Okay. That may be empty from a shell casing. It may not. Point is, don't anticipate it. Okay, 300 yard row. David, the cameraman, over to you. I can hear that shot ring out, and I suspect that was in the engine room. Looks good, you haven't moved, brilliant follow through. Fantastic shot. Well done, 300 yard row. <laughs> you reckon? <laughs> I'm sure, somewhere, somehow. <laughs> Great, fantastic. Nothing wrong with that. You see, you had your arm way. supported on your leg and blah, blah, yeah. you took a bit of wobble out, yeah? Yeah. That's the thing. How'd that feel? That was really good. Comfortable? Comfortable. It's, it's, it's just finding that, because you can... Pause. The yeah. movement and it's just finding yeah. and locking in. Yeah. It's that moment you lock in. Yeah. And don't jerk when you lock in, just squeeze through and try to just pause in the lock in. Don't jerk when you lock in. Let's remember. The only thing yeah. you did do is your arm started to hover slightly, so you make sure you stay down. Stay no, down. It's I, you know what I didn't I don't think I locked in quite as well as I could have done. We'll take another one then. Eh? It's fine. Okay, don't anticipate that shot. Smashing, quite literally. Ding. That in happened the... earlier than I thought it was going to do. Yeah, light trigger. Very. Yeah. Didn't anticipate that actually. <laughs> but I'm quite impressed that actually. Okay. Do you want to try it without sticks? No harm in it. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> Put your legs up. What you're trying to do is get a bench. Yeah, so your legs are up. And you put this arm around here. This is why you end up loading quite strangely. Um, this arm around here, this arm, so, so you actually don't technically sort of almost have a rifle in the shoulder, but it doesn't really matter. You oh, right, yeah. grab this, yeah. grab this, mm. you're leaning against this, you wiggle your knees, and you're holding yourself up and locked in with your arms. Mm. And then that's kind of your elevation, you just rock a bit basically to get higher or lower, find the target. There you go. And then Pop. So you, you take your last breath and then it's when you're, you're exhaling. Different people do it different ways, but I personally... How do you find that point? Well, if you breathe normally, slowly, I find I have a natural pause after I breathe out anyway. Mm. There's a pause. Mm. So you probably, you know, you may be on the in or the out, but there is a natural point. What you don't want to do is find yourself deliberately sort of holding your breath. Because mm. then you start to get short of oxygen and you see when you get shakes. Yeah. Cool. So which one do you want to do? You want to do sitting up there or you want to do kneeling? Uh, the, the one I just showed you, sorry. Okay, the one you just yeah, by all means park there so you don't get filthy, uh, wet trousers. <laughs> Heard the crunch. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Anyone can do this. <laughs> Alright, so just coming in from 300 yards and looking at the target, as you can see, <coughs> the, uh, there's one on the base here that's gone astray. Don't know who, who that was, but apart from that, um, as you can see, pretty tight group at um, 300 yards, shot uh, uh, off a tree, off a fence post, off of a, um, uh, off of a gate, and um, sitting without sticks and sitting. Uh, with sticks and then David putting some shots on target as well for his first time at 300 yard row. So uh, as you can see perfectly practical reasonable shooting positions heart and lung shots generally and um, 
um, you know, enables you to have confidence, say, if you had a longer shot following up a, a wounded animal, for instance, or you had a longer range fox or whatever you were doing. So practical positions, and the more you practice, the better they get. They've been here for more than a century, and they love our coniferous woodlands, our heaths and our acid soil. They have an extensive repertoire of grunts and groans, and we're off down to Dorset with Paul Taylor to learn more about them. Now, no animal is harmed in the making of this particular film. I'm sorry. We're up early to get a glimpse of a herd of seeker during the rut. They're on land managed by top stalker Paul Taylor in Dorset. He has clients from all over the country and many from Scandinavia travel to stalk these large deer. Paul has about 30,000 acres to look after, with a little help, and he has seeker and roe on his ground. He describes himself as a deer manager and not a deer killer, and today we've come to learn a little bit more about his role and the biology of the seeker. Seeker are grazers rather than browsers, so there's a lot of, well, you can see clover and other, all sorts of interesting grasses and things here. Um, they will eat um, f fungus as well. As it gets lighter, we move to some woodland. Paul has a high seat here, and we might have a chance of a closer look at this animal. As Paul has a quick look, a female heads for cover. Like with many deer, they have a distinctive call when the hormones start racing. Paul gives us a blast before we head to the rutting stand. In this case, a smelly wallow, which the seeker find irresistible. Here we are at a, a stag wallow, where they come to display and pee and roll themselves in mud and this is Paco Raban, poor stag. <laughs> this is really the kind of the nightclub show-off area, and uh, and what we uh, what we saw this morning in the half light of dawn was more of the, the bedroom. So uh, that's the entire breeding process for the seeker deer. I'm not a deer killer. I'm a deer manager. So, um, you know, uh, I will respond to uh, overpopulation, of course, by culling lots of females. Yes. And generally, my, my basic policy is to cull a lot of females. So yes. that tends to stabilise the populations. So we haven't got an overrun situation all the time. Yes. And then I'm very careful with the males. So, I, so if anything, I undercull males uh, because uh, I, I want a good broad age structure within those. And, uh, of course, I'm cropping off some substantial animals every year, leaving good breeding an animals to come through all the time, so yeah. that's my policy. Mm. Deer cause huge amounts of damage to crops and gardens, and there's only one way to protect them, unless you bring in Paul, a high fence. I get asked all the time about the deer damage and, and how people can prevent access to their gardens or, or this sort of thing, and I, get, I deal with an area, a public garden actually, where road gets in every year. And the only way is to fence the plantation or whatever it might be, because uh, the, the deer will get in. It's expensive, isn't it? It is an expensive thing, but it's the ultimate, the only way to, to, do, to, to yeah. defend the, uh, the armed the guards. Yeah. Armed yeah, real yeah. How high is this fence? Uh, this fence is which well, is actually under six foot. This one. Right. Um, I mean, the, the, the seeker won't jump it. So, as I um, recall, red deer is two meters. It is. That's right. Red yeah. deer is one point yeah. two, isn't it? I think so. Well, yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so this is good for seeker and I think and so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And good. of course, the rabbit fence at the bottom to stop the rabbits going in here. So. <laughs> You've got the lot yeah. here, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Back at base, Paul shows us some of the animals he's recently taken off, and there are some decent-sized stags. The chiller where I store the deer, Charlie. Ooh, look at them. So yeah. So that's, uh, how much would it? I mean, how much would it cost me to come here and stalk with you and? Shoot a well, we, stag we like charge a daily rate of around £150 a day for the, for the two stalking outings, pretty much. And uh, then we, we, we cost the heads according to the length of the antler for the seeker and the weight of the, the trophy for the, for the roe, roe deer. So, so uh, something like this? Mm, it's an old stag, abnormal, but quite short. Um, what you charge length, that's right, it is, yeah. I mean, you know, you're looking for an average stag, sort of circa, sort of four to five hundred pounds normally, yes. yeah. Okay. And then you also, um, you also mount them 
And yeah, that's right. The taxidermy is another business for me. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Have a look at that? By all means, yeah. What a fantastic place. Do you, uh, do you get many uh, get buffalo in Dorset? Uh, no, we don't. No. <laughs> no you don't. Do you, it looks like this one's yeah. um, having acupuncture. Acupuncture, it does, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's drying, the skin's drying on the form at the moment. It's pasted on. So, so this came to you from Africa and, and you. It did, that's right, yeah. Pinned yeah. over, yeah. pinned it out. Yeah, I get a few African trophies. This is unusual in as much as the front legs are included. Mm. It's to stand against a wall. Normally a shoulder mount is what I get asked to and do. And this is what you... Ah, oh, yes. That's what we've been looking at this morning, actually, the Seeker stag. This is a very dark one. Is, it, is, that, is that what you call melanistic? No, no. The Seeker um, pelage is, is pretty much standard. That's the winter, winter coat. Well, it's the autumn coat now, but it's, the, it's, uh, it's what they have in the winter. They have a, a mane... Uh, during the, the rut, the stags do. So they, they vary a little bit. Some are greyer than others, but generally the stags are very black coloured and the hinds are grey coloured. And in the summer they change to a, a more of a gingery, spotty colour, both sexes. And it's, and it's these ones with the big, thick, palmated antlers that yep. pull the. But they come in black and, and white and spotted. They do, yes, you do get different um, pelage with the uh, the, uh, the fallow deer, yes. various colours, yeah, indeed. And what does it, I mean, there's a lot of talk in Scotland about the hybridisation between red and seeker. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. what does one of those look like? Um, well, the, the, the stags have a characteristic um, ridge on the antlers here. Um, the antlers are a little bit more, they're, they're literally a cross between a seeker stag and a, and a red. They, they're not quite red, not quite seeker. Yes. Um, generally the, the coat is, is brown, mm. it's not, not dark like the seeker. Yes. Um, and the, the muzzle is shorter. Mm. Um, and um, they, I think they may well have a, this sort of pale brow as well on them, which They've again is, is, uh, uh, is a distinctive part of the seeker. Very endearing faces, haven't they? This Mm. They have. Uh, they, they can look a little bit ferocious. So they can look, look down their nose at you slightly <laughs> at times. And, and uh, yeah. Funny yeah. Thank you, Paul, very much indeed for that. Very important. I've learnt a lot from Paul today, and I've also been reminded about the dedication you need to be a top stalker and conservationist. Now, the seeker story is just one of the great pieces we've brought together for you in our new DVD. A year of deer. It's available now on our shop page and we've just added Mark Gardner's fishing DVDs. These cover the truly expert side to fly fishing with the incredible Oliver Edwards. There's also Robert Bucknell and James Marchington's new Foxing DVD. The man that wrote the Foxing Bible shares with us the tips and techniques that'll give you the advantage over Charlie. We use and explain both shotguns and rifles. We demonstrate calls and lamping techniques when you're working as a team or when you're on your own. And once you've taken all that information in, we've got some great fox shooting films showing this incredible predator getting knocked down a peg or two. Also in the shop you'll find pigeons, the expert's way. We talk you through hide building, decoys with Andy Pye, and see how to prepare that huge bag of birds with game chef Mark Gilchrist. This is now available at a reduced price of just twelve ninety five, down from seventeen ninety five. So plenty of options if you're looking to treat yourself or one of your shooting friends. We're back next week when we're out with a party of young shots in Oxfordshire after pheasants. This has been Field Sports Britain. Forget Bond, turn on Bucknell as you recover from your Christmas feast.